It is a privilege today to stand before you today. It's such a journey that God has brought me upon. And I'm sure God has brought you on a journey as well. I remember when George Ali, Pastor Ali, was the pastor of this church. Was, is there anyone else who remembers Pastor Ali? Amen. Not, not many, just a remnant remember him. I remember my parents bringing me here, and the pastor was Pastor Ali. And I don't remember any of his sermons because I was too busy running around. I was a toddler at the time. And I remember one time, I, I somehow got away from my parents, and I went exploring through the church. And I actually went upstairs to, I believe it was this door here, and I opened it during a divine service while they were, I'm sure he was giving the sermon. I remember just like crawling to the other side. So as I look back upon my past, I can really say God is good. God is good. He has brought us in, he has brought us to this point in our lives. And before we begin, I stand here today just a vessel. I don't have anything I can tell you that will help you. There's nothing in me. In fact, it's proven to us with Balaam and the donkey. God can use a donkey to give his message. So we have to be careful of becoming too proud of ourselves, being too happy that we can memorize verses and to stand here and, and speak with the talents that God has given us. So remember, I am just a, a man, and I need your prayers. And before we begin, I will watch the time. I hope to give you one minute. If you could pray for two things. The first thing is pray for me. Pray that God helps me speak only his words and not my words and not my ideas. And please, the second thing is to pray for yourselves. Pray for the Holy Spirit to enter your heart. Pray for God to give you that wisdom that surpasses all understanding. So two things, pray for me and please pray for yourself. I'll watch the time. And very, very solemn times. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes life is so busy. Life is so hectic. There's so many things that we have to keep in our minds that we forget the most important thing. And that is, there is a God. And he is coming again. And we need to get ready. Amen. There's a story that Ellen White talks about in Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2. And she tells this, uh, this account of a conversation of an archbishop with a, a famous actor. And it says this, it says, on a certain occasion when Betterton, a celebrated actor, was dining with Dr. Sheldon, then Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop said to him, pray Mr. Betterton, tell me, why is it that you actors affect your audiences so powerfully by speaking of things imaginary? My Lord, replied Betterton, with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that the reason is plain. It all lies in the power of enthusiasm. We on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real. And you in the pulpit speak of things real as if they were imaginary. Today, brothers and sisters, I don't want to speak to you. I don't want to speak to you about real things in an imaginary way. I want to prove to you beyond a doubt, a reasonable doubt, that the Lord is coming again to bring us home, to put an end to suffering, to put an end to death, to pain, to lying, to stealing, to killing, to backbiting. He's going to put an end to all this, brothers and sisters. Do we want to be there? Do we want to live forever? Amen. Live forever in peace and joy 
and happiness and fellowship. But brothers and sisters, though we want all these things, even myself, I see sometimes I sell all these things short. I sell my inheritance for a cheap price. Today, we will take a look at some prophecies that are fulfilling before our eyes. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verses 15 to 17. And when you're there, please say amen. Amen. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This chapter, many parts of it has already fulfilled, but there are parts of Revelation 13 that have not come to pass yet. I want to take a quick, brief look at it. And in this part, in verse 17, it says very clearly that a, a power is going to restrict everyone's ability to buy and sell. It is going to have control over the economy. It's going to have control over the finances. And as we look into present day society, we can see it is surely coming to pass as the Lord Jesus Christ has told, told us so. The next slide. This is the CEO of what was the most powerful company in the world. Now it's, Apple is not the most powerful company in the world anymore, but this is what the CEO says. Tim Cook says, the next generation of children will not know what money is. This is not just a, a regular man speaking this. This is the CEO of Apple. The next slide. This is what happened within a few months ago, just a few months ago, 2016, November. Why India wiped out 86% of its cash overnight. Remember, Revelation 13 tells us that there's coming a time when the finances of the world, the economy of the world will be controlled to the point where if you do not worship the beast, you will not be able to buy or sell. At the bottom, it says, Pastor, sorry, Prime Minister Modi gave only four hours notice that virtually all the cash in the world's seventh largest economy would be effectively worthless. Can you imagine that? Within four hours notice, all the thousand rupee notes and 500 rupee notes, they're not legal tender anymore. You can't buy things with it. My wife and I, we were preparing, we're preparing to go to, uh, on our mission trip. We're, we're leaving in a few days. And we went to exchange money. And there's a big sign on the door saying, we do not accept rupees or exchange for rupees. India has the second largest population in the world. And, and soon it will be the first largest population in the world. And if they can ban 86% of their cash, what makes us think that they can't do that in Canada? The next slide. This is Australia. The war on cash escalates. Australia proposes ban on the $100 bill. No cash within 10 years. We're going full force into a cashless society. Next slide. This is, this is very interesting. This is, this is the legal document. I, I downloaded it for you. It's like many, many pages, like 20 pages. And this is a initiative, a proposal to, if you see at the title of the initiative, the proposal for an EU initiative on restrictions on payments in cash. The European Union, how many countries are in there? They want to start this up in 2018. 
2018. It's a proposal. Let's pray to God it, it doesn't happen. Let's pray to God God gives us a few more years. Next slide. We see clearly that prophecy is fulfilling before our eyes. We see our economy and our finances being controlled or reaching the point of being controlled. And the Bible tells us that except he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, except them, those people can buy and sell. If you don't accept the mark of the beast or his name or the number of his name, you cannot buy or sell. So we need to have a, a quick, quick recap on who is the beast and what is the mark of the beast. Because to understand what is the mark of the beast, we need to know who is the beast. And I'm not going to spend too much time into it. If you need a Bible study on it, uh, you can reach any of our elders. Anyone. Okay. Really quickly. Revelation 13 verse 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. There is an official title for the Pope, of Vicarious Philae Dei. If you add up the Roman numerals, you know, V as in 5, X as in 10, I as in 1, all these and those other letters that, you know, are not part of the Roman numeral, we count them as zero. If you added up the title of the Pope, and this is not just in one title, he has a few different titles, and they, I think there's like three times his titles add up to 666. 112 plus 53 plus 501. 666. It is the number of a man. So who is the beast? Let's keep going. Maybe this is speculation. Maybe this is speculation. Daniel chapter 7 verse 23 talks about the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. When this power comes, when this beast power comes, his kingdom will be fragmented into ten different kingdoms, and he will destroy, he'll pluck up three of those kings, those kingdoms. Let's go to the next slide. This is what happened after the Roman Empire fell apart. The Roman Empire was never conquered. It fell apart by you know, those barbarians and, and stuff. And it, it split into this. The Franks, alumni, the Burgundies, the Sway, the Visigoths. The Franks became the, was it the French? The Anglo-Saxons became the British. Uh, the alumni became the German. And you have exactly 10 kingdoms here, perfectly, 10. And it says that he will root out three of them. This beast will root out three of them. And history clearly backs this up. When they got into power, they exterminated the alumni, the Heruli, and the Vandals. They're gone. They're gone. Uh, next slide. So these are all characteristics of the beast. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. That's another characteristic. Let's take a quick look at what the paper... A disclaimer. like there are very good Germans and very good Japanese people. Like, it's the Nazis that, that killed a bunch of people. It's the, you know, imperialistic Japanese that killed my grandfather and, and, and made us run overseas, you know? It's not the Japanese we hate. It's that system. It's that system. It's not the Roman Catholics that we have a grudge against. It's the system. This is what the Pope has said, and this is quoted all the time. You can go and look this up, and you can read it, print it out on the encyclopedia. It says, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. These people hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. This is the same God that says, the heavens cannot contain me, the earth cannot contain me. Nothing can contain me. These people hold the place of God. So, we see that, uh, next slide please. We see that he will speak great. He will pluck up three kingdoms. And this one, 
which is so clear to me. It says, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a dividing of a time. Now, he will wear out the saints of the Most High. He will persecute. He will kill the saints of the Most High. For how long? A time, times, and a dividing of a time. A time is 360 days, according to the Jewish calendar. You can prove this with Noah. If you look into Noah, when the world got flooded, you can prove it's 360 days per month. Sorry, per year. And you can see how long a month is also. A time, times, that's times two, and then half a time. That's up to 1,260 days. So for 1,260 days, this beast power will persecute, will kill, will torture, will burn the saints. And also at the same time, he'll try to change times and laws. And there's only one of God's laws that is a time and a law, which is the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. I'm going to uh, give my wife a, a quick signal. So this means next slide. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, these are not pictures I made myself. This is clear. Every, everybody knows this. 1,260 years of papal supremacy. In 538 AD, the Justinian decree went forth. Uh, then you start seeing that it's not the emperor of Rome that's leading the armies to, f to fight the, the invaders or enemies. It's not the emperor of Rome, but it is now the pope who's leading the crusades and, and having control of the armies. From 538 to 1798 is exactly 1,260 years. 1798, the general Berthier, he went into the Vatican, and I'll actually read that for you on the next slide. This is uh, Louis Alexander Berthier. Um, he, you can look him up. You can research him. You, why are we doing this? We are cross-referencing. We're not just going to believe anything that we, that we hear. We're going to double-check it. We're going to Google it at least, right? Berthier. He's born 1753, died in 1815. He's the general of Napoleon, okay? And this is what it says about him. If you just read down, it says, he accompanied Napoleon throughout the brilliant campaign of 1796, and he was left in charge of the army after the Treaty of Campo Formilio. He was in this post in 1798 when he entered Italy, invaded the Vatican, organized the Roman Republic, and took the Pope Pius VI as prisoner back to Valence, France, where after a torturous journey under Berthier's supervision, the Pope died, dealing a blow to the Vatican's political power. Next slide, please. For a time, times, and half a time, 1,260 years, he wore out the saints. He, this power murdered so many millions of Christians. It's mind-blowing. It's creative how he came up with how to wear us out. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. And the Bible tells us that he's going to get his power back in the last days. That the papacy will heal its deadly wound that was inflicted on it in 1798. And today, we can see so clearly that this is fulfilling. What is the mark of the beast? The beast, clearly. It doesn't matter if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. There's a lot of Sunday keepers that know the, the beast. You know, there's lots of beasts, but this particular beast, this little horn, this power is the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. So what is the mark of the beast? Really, really quickly, what is the mark of the beast? Okay. Revelation chapter 14 gives us a message. There is uh, the three angels' message. This is the message for the world. Uh, Revelation 18 has the final warning, the very final warning, which is just a summary of pretty much Revelation 14. It tells us that there's another uh, angel. It's flying throughout the world telling us to fear God and give glory to him. So worship him. For the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, does this underlined part, does it kind of like um, jog any of your memory? Like, is there any other Bible verse that seems eerily similar to him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the waters? Sorry? 
Please speak up. Genesis, yes. Yes, Genesis, chapter 2, right? Talking about how he created everything. And, and that is a proof that the Sabbath is not just for the Jews. Amen. Amen. It is for all mankind, all created human beings. This is found also in Exodus chapter 20. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. We can see that there's only one commandment that has the name of God, the title of God, and his dominion. And that's the fourth commandment. That's the only commandment that has all these things. So we can see that this mark of the beast is, because Revelation 14 talks about don't receive the mark of the beast, right? Uh, next slide. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, if any of you take this mark of the beast because you want to buy and sell, you want to buy groceries and fill up your gas tanks and stuff, if you take the mark of the beast, okay, this is what will happen. It says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And this is not me speaking. This is the Bible speaking. We don't want to take the mark of the beast. We know the beast is the papacy, but the mark, what is the mark? Because there's two things. There's the seal of God, and then there's the mark of the beast. And Satan has a counterfeit to God's things. This is out of their own mouths, and I'm sure this is divine providence. You can go and look up these words printed on a page. These are references. It says, of course the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. They clearly admit they changed it. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Do any of you know why the Reformation failed? You know, we, we, are, we are Protestants. We're all Protestants here. We're not, you know, we're not under the papacy. We don't, we don't do any of that stuff. We don't. Do you know why the Reformation failed? There's a, lot of, there's a few reasons, but one of the reasons why it failed is because the papacy said, hey, you guys still keep Sunday. You, you guys are still with us. What are you guys talking about? Sola, sola Scriptura. You guys believe everything the Bible says. Why are you keeping Sunday then? We know that God has told us a day is coming. In the last days, the finances will be controlled and there will be a mark set up, which is clearly the Sunday observance. Sunday observance. I just want to really, really, really quickly. So if you can focus your attention on the slide, really, really want to quickly go through this. This is uh, March 1st, 2017. And what does it say? Mm -hmm. The Croatian Bishops Conference has again launched an initiative to legally forbid working on Sunday. That's quite interesting. Uh, next slide. Sundays must be a day of rest dedicated to God and family, the Pope says. The European Sunday Alliance calls on MEPs to promote a work-free Sunday and decent work in e EU legislation. Let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake, Fox News. The Lord's Day Alliance says Sunday is a mark of Christian unity, Christian unity. The Daily Mail, the Pope says working on Sunday has negative impact on families and friendships and that priorities in life should be not economic but human. The Vatican official exhorts Catholics to set aside Sundays for God and rest. Pope Francis, religion should not be confined to personal conscience. That's, that's terrible. Pope Francis calls for the new world order again. You need and deserve a secular Sabbath, Sunday. Back to church, Sunday. Over 30,000 churches, um, international churches participating, 1,433 churches participating, 26,000. What to do? The Pope's practical tips for helping the environment. If you read down here, it says go to Sunday Mass. It's one of his suggestions. No work Sundays, good, not just for the faithful. Capitalism's war on the Sabbath. German court enforces day of rest. And on the seventh day, we rested. Time magazine. 
Celebration and rest are vital for harmonious family life. Now, with every one of these articles, they're not talking about the true Sabbath, the Sabbath that God gave us in Genesis chapter 2. They're talking about Sunday. Should Sunday trading be reformed? This is BBC News. Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals and Catholics. Division is the work of the devil. Oh, I think, yeah. I'd be called doing the work of the devil right now. Sunday shopping banned in Croatia. Eurozone demands six-day work week for Greece. Holy Alliance in Italy protests against working on Sundays. Guaranteed that Sundays will be work-free, EU leaders urged. Demonstrations for work-free Sunday. Demonstrations for it. North Dakota Catholic Conference says Sunday law, benefit, Sunday law benefits all people. <laughs> the world from Berlin. Even atheists need to switch off on Sundays. And this one. Church attendance should be mandatory. Let's play this clip. Do we have sound? This is a senator. This is a person who's in charge of our, well, you know, part. She has a, a part to play in making our laws. This is what she says. Out of her own mouth. You see, God has told us to watch and pray. There's going to be clear signs he's going to show us. There will be... Oh. There is a... I can see picture, but no sound. No sound. Okay, perfect. Uh, I set my alarm for 12 o'clock to remind me to pray. I've been trying to keep it as, you know, consistent, right? Would you mind praying with me? It's 12 o'clock. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you in prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for your people and their hearts and their ears, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for revealing to us babes, children, Lord, revealing to us what is going to happen in the future. Father God, we pray that as we look upon these things, our hearts may not be filled with fear, but Lord, that it may be filled with hope, knowing that if all these things are true, oh Lord, it must be true that you died for our sins and that you told us these things would happen. Oh Father God, may you forgive us of our sins. May you help our technical difficulties May you help the sound and the picture, Lord, according to your will, that we may show your people what is going on in this world and what is soon going to come to pass. Thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. While we're working that out, While we're working that out, we're going to go a little bit forward and we're going to see what Jesus Christ has told us to do, what he has warned us about concerning the days that we're living in today. Let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. And God tells us, you know, God, God is trying to help us out. He really will tell us what we need to do. We just have to be humble and to listen. Chapter 3 verse 3 says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. He tells us again in Matthew chapter 24, and I'll read it to you. It says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He's told us clearly he's coming when we are not expecting it. My grandmother, who is still alive, 90... I'm not a very good grandson. 
90 something years old, almost 100. She told me a story. She said that one day I was upstairs playing with her and I was just a baby, like a toddler. And all of a sudden we heard like a boom. And like, and that, that apparently she told me that freaked me out. So I ran and I started hiding in the cabinets. And she was looking for me and she couldn't find me. And she had a call for me and say, Ken, come out, it's okay, Ken, come out, it's okay. And it turns out it was a burglar who kicked the basement door and like ran in and, and stole a bunch of stuff. But it was so surprising. It was just something that you would never, you would not expect. Jesus Christ has told us that it's going to be like that. You're not going to know it's coming. You're not going to know. It's going to be a surprise. And we have to take that very seriously. He gives us more hints and more advice. And he tells us in Matthew 24, verse 37. Matthew 24, verse 37. He tells us, For as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. He tells us that just like the days of Noah, our day is going to be very similar to it. And as we look at the characteristics of the days of Noah, we see in Genesis 6 verse 5, I'll read it to you, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We reach that point today. There's a slide I want to show you, but it's best I don't show you. It is season three of a TV show. Season three of Lucifer. Has anyone heard about this? Lucifer. They have a TV show on Lucifer since his third season. This is the same being that is your worst enemy. This is the being that inspires your enemies to treat you badly. And we're worshiping him. You, you know people that lie to you and use you and trick you and are lazy and, and everything. This is the being that started all this and we're worshiping him. The thoughts of the imagination were only evil continually. We have definitely reached that. Just flip through your TV channels. You'll see a bunch of debauchery, everything. When Jesus talks about the days of Noah though, he doesn't talk about the sins of murder, of vice, of adultery. He doesn't talk about these. Let's keep reading. This is Matthew chapter 24, verse 38. So we just go, we keep on going. It says, just like the days of Noah, right? It says, Matthew chapter 24, verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, Christ doesn't go into, you know, they're killing and murdering and stealing and all these kind of things. He just says they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. That is, that's not a sin, ladies and gentlemen. But it, it becomes a sin when it takes the place of God, when it is above God, when you care more about what you're going to feed your belly than glorifying God, it becomes a problem. And we have definitely, brothers and sisters, have reached that point in society. Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, getting divorced, clearly we're in this. Likewise, in, he continues, and he, after he talks about the days of Noah, he talks about the days of Lot, and he says, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that the lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Remember, he's telling us to remind us. He says, don't forget this, don't forget this. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. I walk my dog. I try to walk my dog every day. And I see giant, super nice mansions popping up all along, all along my neighborhood. I, I'm sure you guys see that too, right? Just construction, construction, construction. We are eating and drinking. We are buying, we're selling, we are building, we are planting with no thought 
that soon it is all coming to an end. It has become our God. In, in Philippines, there's an active volcano and they're building all around it. Like, that thing erupted before and killed so many Filipinos. And now they're building around it more. Like, it's just, it's like build, 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 build. You gotta make money. But let's go back to the slide of the, the senator. But we have to remember, God has told us that money will be of no use to us when the Sunday law comes, when the mark of the beast is enforced, when they make it a cashless society. All around the world is happening. In Sweden, take a look at Sweden. They're going cashless. This is what the, the lady says, the senator says. Okay. Uh, you're going to have to YouTube it. I see we have some technical difficulties. But essentially, right out of her mouth, she says, we should probably be debating a bill to legislate mandatory church worship on Sunday. Okay? Uh, you can YouTube it. It's, very, it's, it's pretty clear. A lot of people are up in arms. And they should be. They should be. Okay. We see that God has warned us not to be absorbed in these things, which I will clearly admit I have definitely been absorbed in buying and selling, planting, building, making a career for myself, you know, all these kind of things. I, I know how easy it is to get into it. But as we take a step back and we look at what we have, as we take a look at what we're striving for, what do we really want, we can see that it is so pointless. For example, what is the, the Canadian dream? Get yourself a house. Have three bathrooms in it, three dining rooms in it, five bedrooms in it, have a pool. The thing is that when you eat food at your dinner table, you, you can't eat food at the other dinner tables. Like, are you going to walk to your other dinner tables and eat food there also? Like, why would you ever need three dining room tables, ever? Why do we need 30 jackets? 30 jackets. Why do we need closets full of shoes? So many shoes. All the colors of the rainbow. For what reason? Multiple cars. So many vehicles in our house. You only allowed three on your property, by the way. Uh, if anything more, you can get reported and they can, they can find you. <laughs> People know by experience. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, so Noah, uh, God has told us very clearly that the sins will not be murdering and killing and vice and all those kind of things. Yes, they are happening, but he tells us to be careful of specifically in a way, materialism, self-indulgence. Uh, Luke 21, 35 sums it up pretty well. It says, For as a snare, it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time. So take heed. So this is Jesus Christ talking to us. He's saying, caution, okay? Like, pay attention. Lest at any time your hearts become overcharged with surfeiting. Surfeiting. We don't use the word surfeiting anymore. But it's a word that we should probably start using because you can see it all over Facebook. Uh, does anyone know what surfeiting means? That's okay. I didn't know either. I had to Google it. It says surfeiting is the definition of surfeiting. It's, it's overindulgence. It's excessive eating. It's, it's in regards to food. Excessive eating. The synonyms include gorging, overfeeding, overfilling, glut, cram, stuff, overindulge. On Facebook, I scroll through my Facebook. It's a habit I need to stop. But I see a bunch, like my friends are just posting pictures of their food and all the, the nice food they're eating. And it's like, this is surfeiting. God tells us, be careful of surfeiting. Be careful of drunkenness, drunkenness. And I know firsthand, I used to love getting drunk. Like, all my friends, my circle of friends, it's just party on the weekends. Get drunk on the weekends. Get drunk on Wednesday after you're done your homework too. Just get drunk. Be careful of surfeiting. Be careful of drunkenness. And this one, the last warning says, 
and cares of this life. Cares of this life. Are we so caring about this world and our clothes and our shoes and our, our things that we are forgetting the most important thing in our lives? In the days of Noah, there were all these things going on. And today, it is happening also. In Spirit of Prophecy, there is a very interesting quote. Very interesting. In fact, it's debated a lot. I want to bring your minds back to the flood. So rewind a minute. The flood is something that happened on this earth. It is, it's extremely disputed, but for Christians, it is undisputable. The flood really did happen. There's a lot of scientific proof for it. We're finding seashells on the top of mountains, okay? We, we have people, um, I'm not sure what the credentials of Walter White is, but I think he's like a PhD with like many, many bachelors. But you can look into it. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, promote it too much. I, I've been Googling. Right, sorry, Robert, do you know? He's a doctor, he's a doctor. And he used to teach biology. He's a zoologist, yes, thank you, brother. He's a zoologist, he was teaching a lot of students, right? And he actually goes through and he shows that the science really backs up that there really was some kind of flood. If you take a look at the fossils, the only way that they can be preserved like that is if there was a really quick flood and a burial. Not only that, all around the world, all around the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, North America, all around the world, there are, I don't want to give an exact number because, you know, you don't really always know the exact number, but there's like more than 50. That's a lot of nations. There's like, there's probably under 100. I'm not too sure, but it's a lot. I'll give you some examples. There, there's myths around the world and in so many different civilizations about a worldwide flood. In India, India, it says Manu and Matsa. Okay, and now the, the next like three minutes of what I'm going to say is just complete like baloney. So don't, don't memorize it. India, Manu and Matsa. Matsa, the incarnation of the Lord Vishnu as a fish. He forewarns Manu, a human, about an impending catastrophic flood and orders him to collect all the grains of the world in a boat. In some forms of the story, all living creatures are also to be preserved in the boat. When the flood destroys the world, Manu survives by boarding the ark and, you know, da da da. In Korea, Mok Dori Yong, a son was born to a fairy and a tree. The fairy returned to heaven when the boy was seven years old. One day, rains came and lasted for many months, flooding the entire earth with a raging sea. The L'Oreal, in danger of falling, told his son to ride him, ride him when it, you know, all the waves and stuff. China, it's hard for me to read this. It's so much nonsense. China, the supreme sovereign ordered the water god Gong Gong to create a flood as punishment and warning for human misbehavior. Gong Gong flooded the world and extended it for 22 years. People had to live in high mountains and caves and trees, fighting with wild animals for scarce resources. Uh, North Dakota, the, the native, native Indians or Native Americans, which one's more politically correct? The earth is a large tortoise. Large, the, the earth is a large tortoise. Once a tribe was digging for badgers, they dug too deep into the earth and cut through the shell of the tortoise. The tortoise began to sink and water rose through the knife cut. The water covered all the ground and drowned all the people except for one man who escaped in a large canoe to a mountain in the west. Uh, the Cherokee, day after day, a dog stood at the riverbank. Uh, the dog said a flood was coming, that, he, that a human must build a boat. And that man survived and became the present population it is now. Lots and lots and lots of myths. And of course, as it gets passed on, you know, no offense to any of these myths. I know I'm being recorded, no offense to these myths. Um, but as I get passed and passed along, we, can, we know how talking works. It will, story will change a bit, right? But this is all eerily similar to the flood, the great flood that the Bible tells us about. Does anyone know the earliest 
surviving great work of literature. Earliest surviving, like the earliest one we have. It's from Mesopotamia. Uh, does anyone know? Huh? The Epic of Gilgamesh. Praise God. The Epic of Gilgamesh is considered the earliest surviving great work of literature. And do you know what is written in that story? Has anyone bothered to read it? I don't know if our brother, our brother here is. Brother, what, what is, can you say really loudly? Is it about a man building a boat? You kind of double, you gotta cross-reference me, you know? Is it, a man about, is it about a man who's building a boat, survives a flood, giant world flood? And this is what he does actually. He, he sends a dove and the dove returns. And he sends a swallow and then he sends like a raven, but the raven does not return. You know, it's something like that. It's similar, right? That's right, Mesopotamia. So all around the world, all around the world, even in South America, they have their, the Spanish also have these myths. The Chinese have these myths. The Romans have these myths. The Europeans have these myths. The Celtics have these myths. All these civilizations have these myths about a worldwide flood. And today, we need to realize it's not a coincidence they all have these myths. It's because a worldwide flood really did happen. Really did happen. And we cannot forget that. The Spirit of Prophecy says something very interesting. And it talks about this. It's quite controversial. I hope you don't look into it. It's not salvational. It's just debate. But I just want to read it out for you guys, okay? This is in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, verse 64. It says, talking about the antediluvians, but if there was one sin above another, if there was one sin above another, which called for the destruction of the race by the flood. It was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast, which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. God purposed to destroy by a flood that powerful long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him. If there was one sin that called for the destruction of the race of the flood, if there was one thing that was really serious to God that we should not have been playing with, it was combining man and animals. And today, we have begun that. This is, uh, on the right side is a dog, the, the, what the dog is supposed to look like. On the left side is when they, they went in there, they played with the dog's DNA and the dog's genes, and they made it super strong, super strong. The next slide says, scientists who have grown a human ear on the back of a rat say they will be able to use them in humans in five years. We are coming step by step to the days of Noah, perfectly as God has foretold. Here's a picture of the rat in the ear. Human ears could be grown within five years, claim the Japanese scientists who have unveiled a rat with an ear on his back. Engineering the human race. New technology gives us the power to manipulate the human genome, but should we use it? Thank God the Holy Spirit is still restraining us. We still have some morality in us, some ethics in us, not to do these kind of things. But we are going. We are going. Chinese scientists genetically modify human embryos. Chinese scientists have successfully edited the genetic information of human embryos. The researchers use CRISPR. You're going to hear this word a lot, CRISPR. It's like you can manipulate the genes. Like you, you can have a, we have all our, we know what our genes are, our chromosomes are. This is like a tool that can manipulate it to remove genetic mutations. And of course, they're going to say it's for the, you know, peace and safety. Next. Three parent babies. UK clinic gets okay for groundbreaking technique. This is not good. This is not good. If there was one sin above the rest that called for the flood, it was amalgamation of man and beast. We are going there, full steam. Uh, next slide. All of these things I've shown you, by God's grace, what do we do? That's a real question. Number one, realize this is really happening. When, I, when my wife and I saw all this evidence and this proof, we kind of just like, ah. Uh. But it came a point in our life where God sat us down and just said, Ken, you've got to take this seriously. And when he showed me these things, when he showed my wife and, and I these things, not just these things, but hours and hours and hours of hours worth of people worshiping Satan, of people just prophecy fulfilling. 
I, I just like, I just stared at the wall for like half an hour. I didn't know what to do. And all, all through my mind was just like, this is real. This is real. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. This is, this is real. But we shouldn't stop there, brothers and sisters. We have to take the next step by faith and with courage from God. What do we do? What do we do? What do we have to do? And God has told us what we have to do. Let's turn our Bible to 2 Peter, verses 3 and 6. And we're almost done. 2 Peter, and yes, let's, let's have a few more things, but let's, let's go fast. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 6. And when you're there, please say amen. It says, Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should have repentance. All should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God has told us clearly, don't invest in the world. Everything's going to melt. Everything. Everything's going to melt. Would you invest in a company that you knew was going to go bankrupt? Would you put your, your life savings in it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And if we have that kind of logic, we should apply that logic to this world. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11. The next, the next verse. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? There are many things that we need to do by God's grace, but here, in regards to the flood, in regards to the coming flood of fire, what kind of people should we be in these two aspects? in all holy conversation and godliness. Let's take a look at the very first one, holy conversation. Your words, I want to make it very clear, when you speak your words, they don't come back to you. You can't take them back. You can't, you can cry and cry and beg, but you will never get those words back. There are people that have said things on TV and like their career is ruined, ruined. Your words can determine your fate 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. Uh, for the sake of time, we're going to just quickly analyze it. Uh, Saul has gone to battle with the Philistines. David, by God's grace, has been kept from the battle, so he doesn't have to fight his own master, right? And basically, David is waiting for the results of the battle between the Philistines and, and uh, Saul and his army. And uh, an Amalekite, a young Amalekite man comes and he thinks that, you know, because Saul has been chasing David, has been hating David and, and trying to kill David, he thinks that David would be really happy if he brings him news of Saul's death. And he goes to, to, King, uh, he goes to David and he says, really humbly, really humbly, he says this. Let's go there. First Samuel. I'm going to read it out. I, I shouldn't paraphrase everything. First Samuel, chapter 1, verses... Samuel. Sorry, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter 1. Okay, this is what the Amalekites said. In, in 2 Samuel, chapter 1, verses, uh, let's say, verse 8. And he said unto me, who are you? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live, that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and brought them hither unto my Lord, unto my Lord, you, David. So right away we see that, hey, he's trying to say that, you know, he was already wounded. Saul was already wounded. He was already going to die. I just, I had mercy on him. I killed him to not prolong his pain. And I've brought these things to you, my Lord. This is not true. This is a lie, okay? This is a lie because we know 
If you read about the account, Saul killed himself. He fell on his own sword. Your words can determine your fate. This is what happened to him. David was so upset. He was upset. He was sad that, that King Saul died. He was really genuinely sad. And this is what he says to the young man. He says, And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said unto him, How was it that you were not afraid to stretch forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall on him. And he smote him and he died. And David said unto him, Your blood be upon your head, for your mouth has testified against you, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. How many times do we testify against ourselves? We have to be careful what we say, brothers and sisters. Because you can testify against yourself. You don't have to say, I lied, I, I'm a bad person. You can testify against yourself by lying to the Holy Spirit, by saying, yes, I did bring all the money to, to you guys. I did sell all my property and give it to you. You can testify against yourself by telling a lie. You can trick, you can trick me. I'm easily tricked. You can treat a lot, trick a lot of people, but you can't trick God. You can't trick God. Jesus Christ has also told us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, he says that every idle word that men shall speak, every word you speak, you will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words you shall be justified, and by thy words you shall be condemned. Our words have power. Remember two things. Holy conversation. Be careful what you say, brothers and sisters. Be careful. There are things that we should not say. I, I need to be careful too. I'm not just saying you guys. I definitely have to be careful. In fact, I've probably said a few things up here that I shouldn't have said, right? But thank God you've, you've given me the benefit of the doubt. Our words can determine our fate. Remember that. Now, I've heard things so often that I need to address it. And it's, you know what? You know, we all, this is what they say. This is, if you ever hear yourself saying this, you need to remember this. We all are hypocrites. We all have faults. We all make mistakes. Okay? We're not, none of us are perfect. That's all true. But you have to be careful because that's, it's such a fine line. You can easily begin to use that as an excuse to justify not becoming better, not repenting. Do, do you guys understand what I'm saying? It's easy to turn that into an excuse. The last point, which is, remember, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, everything's going to melt. What manner of person should you be in all holy conversation and godliness? Godliness means being like God. And it's a word that we don't use much anymore. I looked it up and the frequency of the use on Google, and it, it, it peaked in uh, 1844, by the way, and it dropped so low. I only, got, I only got 5 million search results on Google. 5 million. But just for curiosity, I looked up Justin Bieber. He got 55 million. There's more info on how to be like Justin Bieber than there is how to be godly. It's, it's ridiculous. We need to remember that God has created us, human beings, in his image. And we ought to behave like God. It's very important. Now, as we close, God has given us a warning how to be godly, okay? And he dealt with these kind of people. And we're going to take a quick look at it. I'm just going to read it to you. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not do ye after their works, for they say and do not. What do you call a person that says something but doesn't do it? It's a hypocrite. And that word is, is so negative nowadays. It's, it's really, really negative nowadays. If you want to offend someone, you call them a hypocrite, right? This is what the definition of a hypocrite. One who plays a part, especially one who for the purpose of winning approbation of favor, puts on a fair outside seeming who feigns to be other and better than he is, a false pretender of virtue or piety, 
one who simulates virtue or piety. We have to be so careful that we don't do this. We have to, every single one of us, we have to be careful we don't do this. Because Jesus Christ has told us what is the result of this happening. He tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, he says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, he began to say to his disciples, First of all, beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Be careful of hypocrisy. Why? Matthew 13, verse 33, he talks, Jesus Christ talks about the kingdom of God and he compares it to leaven, leaven. Another parable he spake unto them, Matthew 13, 33, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal to the whole was leavened. You put a little bit of leaven in your dough and you leave it overnight and it will become really big. With hypocrisy, what hypocrisy does to us you might have an idea. You have an idea. And your idea is, it's clear. You can't steal things. Stealing is wrong. Stealing is breaking the, what's that? Eighth commandment. It's, it's breaking the commandments. You can't steal. But I really like this microphone. I really need it. You know, sometimes I need to talk, my voice goes, I need a microphone. But stealing is wrong. Now, if I take this microphone, if I steal this microphone, my thoughts, my idea is stealing is wrong, but my action is stealing. So let me tell you what God has showed me these past few weeks. It's either my actions change to be in accordance with my ideas. So if my idea is stealing is wrong and I steal things, either my action changes, either I stop stealing things, Either my action changes or my idea changes. Oh, you know, hey, the church makes so much money anyways. They collect tithe from me every week. It's just like a $30 microphone. Don't worry about it. I go to work every day. I work so hard, they don't even notice me at work. It's okay. I can take some paper clips. I need some paper clips at home. I got taxes to do. I, I, I can steal some sticky notes. I can steal a pen that doesn't belong to me. And you start justifying. You see, either your actions change or your ideas change. And Jesus Christ has told us to be careful of this because it will leaven you all the way through. Imagine this is the platform of truth that I'm standing upon. And I decide that I'm going to be a hypocrite and that I'm going to steal things. Okay, so one sin, one sin. Okay, you know what? I'm a hypocrite. I shouldn't be stealing. I know I shouldn't be stealing. But if I stay in this platform for long enough, this will become my new platform of truth. You know, stealing's okay. You're stealing some, you know, it depends, right? Then the very next step is really easy. You know what? You know, it's okay to lie too sometimes. You know, you gotta protect people, right? It's okay to lie, people. Oh, it's just, it's just one step up. You see how easy it is to go one step after one step after one step to the point you're leavened all the way through? Because this is now your new platform of truth. This is, you're not, you're not going anywhere. Hypocrisy, brothers and sisters, something I need to work on. Something that every single one of you need to work on. Do you know why? Because we profess to be Christians. We profess to be Seventh-day Adventists, to be serving God. Yet by our actions, we deny him, right? It makes me sad. It should make you sad. I'm not speaking down on any of you. I'm not speaking down on any of you. This is just something that God has warned us about. Holy conversation. Watch your mouth. And godliness. Don't be a hypocrite. Brothers and sisters, as we close, the title of this sermon is The Test of Sincerity. We all want to be sincere. Today is the day to be sincere. Not next week. Not next week. It's, it, it's always a slippery slope. Today. Do it today. And what do you need to do? What do you need to do? You need to get on your knees and pray to God and say, God, I am a sinner. You need to really communicate to God. Tell him, I need your help. I can't do this. I've tried to do this. I hate you so much sometimes. These things I've really said to him. But help me, Lord. I know this is real. Brothers and sisters, 
the Protestant Reformation is coming to an end this year. We are watching a cashless society come at us full steam. We are watching the papacy get its strength back. We're watching Donald Trump. Uh, Betty, if you could put the PowerPoint on. Donald Trump has vowed to close the gap between church and state. Last time they closed the gap between church and state, they killed Jesus Christ. When the Pharisees, the religious, the church, combined, worked with the state, the Romans, they crucified our Lord. Donald Trump vowed to close the gap between church and state. Okay, next slide. The Pope just met with dozens of mayors about climate change. Very last thing, just want to let you know. Before they set up, before Nebuchadnezzar set up the golden image and commanded everyone to worship it and to bow down to it, he got all the captains, all the guards, he got all the, the important people and he, he brought them. The Pope has just met with dozens of mayors and he tells you the reason why in the next slide. He says, Sanchez says the Vatican hopes mayors can play a decisive role in countering the wave of populism, was it populism? Spreading across Europe. He says citizens trust mayors more than the national politicians and their actions can influence the policies at the regional, national, and even global level. Any of you that have been studying spirit of prophecy know that it, the Sunday law will be called by the people. The people will want it. The Pope has said very clearly that the mayors, it's just like the King Nebuchadnezzar, he got all the captains, the guards of 100, right? The Pope is also gathering the mayors. The mayors are our today's captains. And we trust our mayor more than our prime minister. We're coming full steam, brothers and sisters, and we have to get serious in our conversation and in our godliness. Brothers and sisters, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer to our God. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you in prayer. And Lord God, all these things that were spoken, oh Lord, they are difficult, Lord. And I didn't want to present this message, but it was the message that you gave me to tell to your people. Father God, help us not to be like the antediluvians. Help us not to make the same mistakes as them, Lord. But Father God, help us to learn from them. Help us to be the type of people that you want us to be in our conversation, in our actions, Lord. Father God, talk is cheap. We don't trust what people say. We trust their actions, Lord. We know a person by their actions. And Father God, we know you are not a hypocrite. We know that you have backed up everything you said, Lord. Lord, you have said to love your enemies. And Father God, we have been your enemies for so long and you have still loved us. Lord, you have told us to forgive and to turn the other cheek. And Lord, you have done that. Lord, you are not a hypocrite. And Father God, you have told us that the power came from divinity. So Lord, infuse us with that kind of divinity to turn the other cheek, to love one another, to guard our tongues, Lord, and not to dishonor thee or thy son. Father God, we're living in such solemn times. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I thank you for your children, Lord. And we pray that these words may not be forgotten, but that they may be thought upon. That these words may not just go in one ear or the other and out the other, but Lord, that they may wrought a change in the hearts of your people. Father God, help us to be an influence in this world. Help us to bring more people to Christ. And Lord God, we thank you that you are willing to work with sinful human beings fallen human beings to spread your gospel. Help us, Lord, to do your will. Thank you, Father God, for hearing our prayers. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.